Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Ariel Leger, and I am CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator based out of the University of Arizona in Tucson. For those who are new to CCAST, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, and drought adaptation. Today, we're lucky enough to be hearing from John Milliken and Jerry Bethelet about glass, grassland restoration projects to support pronghorn in southeastern Arizona. Uh, John Milliken will be presenting first. Uh, John holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Arizona in Wildlife Ecology and has retired from the Arizona Game and Fish Department for 30 years as a wildlife manager. John was instrumental in the transplant of Chihuahuan pronghorn into the San Bernardino Valley and has been at the forefront of gold turkey management and translocation efforts throughout southeastern Arizona. John currently is the Arizona Antelope Foundation Field Project Manager, Chairman of the Sierra Vista and Douglas Habitat Partnership Committee, and President of the Huachuca Goulds Chapter of National Wild Turkey Foundation. With 43 years experience in the development and implementation of Habitat Partnership Committee and various Habitat Project grants, where he has closely worked with landowners, land managers, agencies, conservation organizations, and volunteers. Um, we're really lucky to have John with us here today. And without further um, ado, I'll pass it. I'll pass it to John. And one final reminder um, to keep putting questions that you have as as John is speaking into the chat, and we'll get to those during the Q and A. So to you, John. Thank you, Ariel, and thank you, CCAST, for having me here today. What I'm going to be talking about is um, the Arizona Animal Foundation National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant that was done from 2010 to 2019. It was entitled the Southeastern Arizona Grassland um, Pronghorn Initiative. Um, over the course of that 2010 to 2019, there was uh, three grants that we were fortunate enough to, to get um, that totaled $510,000. Of course, with all the grants, there's an uh, in-kind which has to match the grant amount and a total in-kind um, match that we had after the project was complete was $1.23 million, which ended up resulting in a final project financial total of um, a little over $1.7 million. Through that grant, we looked, we were working in southeastern Arizona and we looked at six specific herd zones. Those herd zones starting from the west of, um, was Altar Valley, the San Rafael Valley, Sonoida Plains, Allen Flat, Bonita, and the San Bernardino Valley. Over that period of time, we looked at primarily three different types of accomplishments that we wanted to complete. They were, they were broken down into grassland restoration projects, which included burning, grubbing, and herbicides. There was also water developments and then also fencing. So I'll, I'll first talk about the, uh, the grassland restoration practices. So if Ariel, if you could go to the slides. Our projects included developing travel routes for pronghorn. The project that you see on the screen right now was a right-of-way mesquite removal projects that we completed along highways 83 and 82 that are outside of Sonoida. And what we wanted to do is we had pronghorn, our population started in increasing over time and our population were moving across these state highways. And there was a conflict with the motorized traffic and um, pronghorn getting hit as all along with the safety of, of vehicles traveling up and down these roads. And so we worked with ADOT and developed, went out and developed specific locations where we wanted to clear the mesquite along these, these um, state highways. Um, and we worked with ADOT and then a, a Department of Corrections uh, 
group and they came out and we cleared those those pro those areas along that the right of way there if we go to the next slide this is the the doc crew and a dot and they brought in we cut the trees down we mulched all the veg all the the mesquites that were there on that highway and opened that up and also a dot went in there and uh, sprayed the stumps with herbicide and uh, to prevent any regrowth on there. Next slide. This is just gives you an idea of the projects on the grub, the, the grubbing projects that we completed. And this is an idea of the cleared versus the uncleared area. It's along a fence line. You see that the cleared is, is, is really easily identified uh, versus the uncleared area. When we did these projects, we worked on a um, a large scale habitat um, grassland restoration area. We didn't want to go in and and uh, sort of shotgun approach this. We wanted to go and work into areas that we could have connectivity um, of projects over a large expanse. Many times these are tied to watersheds. Um, also wildlife populations in the area and um, we're increasing connectivity and permeability, not only with the habitat, but the, the pronghorn movement or the wildlife movement that we're um, working on. Next slide. This is just shows the machinery that we've been utilized um, when we're doing it. These are big excavators that we're utilizing. Um, and um, So this just gives you an idea of the magnitude of, of the machines that we're working on. Uh, they're able to go in there and pluck the, the mesquite out of the ground and get the big tap root and minimize any regrowth. The next slide. We not only, many of these, they went back in after we, we removed these and we did brush piles. Um, for the most part, there were some areas that some of the landowners decided to do windrows. Along with doing the brush piles, we were also part of this was educating the Arizona Game and Fish Commission and other partners um, about exactly what we were doing. Once those brush piles were, were or the, the grubbing area was cleaned up and raked and put in the brush piles, they were later, many of these brush piles were later burned. Um, some of the brush piles, especially later on in the project, um, when we tweak some of the, the outcomes and our best practices um, were left and utilized for, for quail um, and other small um, wildlife species. Next slide, please. Over the course of this, the project that we were doing grubbing over probably five to seven years after grubbing was done, we were starting to see um, second growth of mesquites coming back in. So we started developing a maintenance strategy utilizing herbicides, um, either aerial, a foliar, or a ground application type herbicide. Um, what we would do is we'd go out there and, and mark the, or add to the herbicide, we'd add the dye so that we were able to make sure that we were able to identify all the, the, the the mesquites that were being sprayed so that we minimized uh, missing any of the mesquites out on an acreage of land. Uh, next slide, please. And this sort of gives you an idea of what our, our pre and post um, work look like. You can see on the right hand side, the, um, the effort of a herbicide after it killed a lot of that second growth. And then on the left hand side, there was, there's an area there that shows um, an area that at one time had been grubbed, but the, the, the result over a period of time was that, that regrowth of mesquites. And so we are back to square one again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this also shows an issue with, with that second growth uh, mesquite. This is over on the Las Cienegas. It was an area that was grubbed at one time. And over a period of three to four years, we started seeing this, the mesquites coming back in. 
Um, so it is something that we're needing to look at in the future. Um, another project that we did was burning. This was a, a burn that we completed in a Sacatone bottom. We were utilizing this. We were trying to develop a, a corridor around the Sinoida um, mini ranch ants are all through that area and develop a, a corridor where pronghorn were at across the Baba Kamari River um, onto public lands and gave them access back on the Los Cienegas. So that was another opportunity that we had for um, grassland restoration. Uh, next slide. Um, water management was another important. Um, well, let me just step back that, and just give an overview of what we did on the, the grassland projects um, before I go to the water. Um, overall, we, we worked in four herd zones. Uh, we restored almost 7,900 acres uh, through the burning, grubbing, and the herbicides. And so we completed, of those, we completed 11 grassland um, projects in those four herd zones. So that sort of gives you an idea of, of the effect that we had uh, throughout these, these different herd zones and these uh, pronghorn populations. Okay, let's go to the next one. Thank you, Ariel. We developed um, overall through the project um, timeline, we developed 13 water projects in four, four herd zones. Uh, it allowed for a year round distribution of pronghorn and other wildlife species. And also it gave year round water, um, secure year round water for, for wildlife and for livestock that were in those areas on those ranches. This is one of the projects that we did. This is the Davis pasture pronghorn water. This is an exclosure. It's not utilized by um, pronghorn. It was done on BLM properties. We utilize the, the storage tank and a whale that's up on top of the hill. Um, and then that water is fed down to the drinkers down below for, for the use by pronghorn and other wildlife. Next slide. This is a project that we redeveloped again. We, we utilized um, funds and, and partnership funds that we've developed over the years, which I'll talk about later, uh, where we pumped water from a well up to a storage tank. Um, into these troughs that were already there. They'd, historically, they'd been there, these cement troughs. The reason we needed to do that is there was a dam upstream of this, but over the last many years of our drought, the bottom cracked and the, the dam um, started cracking and that dam didn't hold water. At one time, that was a year round water source um, throughout this area. Uh, but due to the other complications that I talked about, we were able to, to go back in and utilize some of that, the infrastructure that was on the ground and just add to that with a storage tank and a water line to an existing well. The next slide, please. Okay, this, is, this shows another project that we did. This was on a, on a livestock allotment. We, we did a metal trough. We really worked with the landowners on these troughs to make sure that they were not too high um, and it would allow um, wildlife and, and smaller wildlife and young to get into those waters. And part of our, 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 our grant and part of our partnership and development with these landowners was that these waters were to stay on year round. So next slide, please. You can see here sort of what was in the past to deliver water, the windmill, but those are costly and they're, they're, they take a lot of, of maintenance uh, with replacing leathers on a, on a year round basis. So we've been working with the landowners to come up with funding to put solar on these wells. Um, there's a lot less maintenance. Um, they're long-term at that point. And so it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to work directly with the landowner on, on, on upgrading their, their water systems and providing with solar. Next slide. We worked with volunteers a lot. 
And this is just one of the water lines that we put in on a ranch um, on the rose tree and utilize volunteers to help um, with our in-kind. Our volunteers, when we looked at our volunteers, um, they completed the majority of our work, particularly when we get into the fencing aspect. Um, we had almost 800 volunteers. They completed nearly four, or 13,300 hours of labor. Those hours were put toward our in-kind match for our grant, um, but they were, they were a key component on us being able to, to get on the ground and do a lot of these projects. And when we, I think next we'll be talking about the fencing and the connectivity that we did with that. And they were the, the backbone of all our fencing work that we did. Next slide, please. Oh, I guess I spoke ahead of myself. Um, we did, the other thing that we did with waters is we did some dirt tank clean outs. In areas where there were no wells, um, they were in a good watershed that supplied good runoff. Um, many of these tanks had not been cleaned out in 40, 50 years. Um, they were all um, silted in. And so we utilized HBC funds and some other funds that we had to go back in and uh, clean out some dirt tanks and provide year round water again and get rid of that siltation in those areas. And uh, the problem with the siltation when it got in there is even when there was water in there, if it got down low, uh, livestock and even and wildlife would bog down and they couldn't get to the water. And sometimes they would even get stuck and, and die in those areas. Next slide. Okay, now we're gonna be talking about some fencing. Next slide. Fence rebuilds, I mean, a lot of the fences that we dealt with um, were not, they were old fences that had been put in again 40, 50 years ago. At the end of our project, um, pronghorn connectivity was improved on 190, approximately 192,000 acres. Um, we completed 27 fencing projects and we modified over 105 miles of fence. A lot of the fences we did, we even like that, that, that last slide, we either removed that, that fence and rebuilt it, or in some instances we went in and, and just um, repaired the fence and made the fence in a lot better shape than it was. We put stays in it. The vast majority of our modifications on fences was that we, we um, removed the bottom strand and replaced it with a smooth wire after getting approval through the, the ranchers. And we put that bottom strand at 16 inches to 18 inches above ground to allow easy access for pronghorn to move underneath the fences. Next slide. This is just another uh, right of way fence modification along with the uh, work that we did on removing mesquites in those. We also modified the fence to allow, most of the right of way fences have five strands. The bottom strand is, um, usually about 10 inches off the ground. We removed that. Again, we had to get approval through ADOT to do that, which we, we were able to do, and uh, place that, that bottom strand of smooth wire at 16 inches above ground. Uh, because it's a right of way and a lot of boundary fences, um, we weren't able to go above that 16 inch standard. Next slide. This is a brand new fence that we, we paid for through our grant where we supplied all the, the materials, the T-posts, the stays, the wire, the clips, everything. And the cost share or the in-kind was done by the landowner. He either removed the existing fence, um, if there was one, which most of the times there was, and then he replaced it with this new fence. Next slide. I think that's it. I think we- uh, oh, good. There, John. That's good. So, um, Along with that, with those types of endeavors, we, um, throughout all this time, we had hired a GIS specialist and we developed a GIS database. Um, over the, the years, we developed uh, 658 different total layers, which we allowed to monitor pronghorn movement and uh, habitat changes throughout our herd zones. Also, we worked directly with the Game and Fish Department. They translocated and transplanted 
95 pronghorn to six herd zones. And they, those pronghorn came from various locations in Arizona and in New Mexico. And those, those translocations are used for genetic diversity and uh, herd supplementation. The pronghorn population increased to a minimum of, of 548 animals as of August 2019, or by a minimum, I should say, of 548 animals um, as of August 2019. I'm sure that, that, that number is increased. Um, we just, we've been doing some saturated surveys um, every year in a lot of these herd zones, and then Game and Fish does aerial surveys in there, and our population is doing very well. Um, even in spite of some of our, our dry drought conditions that we've had over the last couple of years. We had set a minimum viable population objective of 125 animals, and that was met in three of the six subpopulations. Uh, the key component, as I mentioned with our volunteers, the key component of and our success with this within this NIFWIF grant was our partnerships. Developing that collaboration. Um, between state, local, federal landowners, our volunteers, businesses. At the end of our, our eight year period, we had developed uh, 72 different partners. And out of those, there was 20 different ranches that we developed partnerships and worked um, hand in hand with them. The partnership is something that's really important. It, it, it takes a lot of effort to do that. It takes that collaboration and the upfront understanding that we're in a win-win situation. Uh, when we're dealing with landowners, it's important that you understand their business model. And a lot of people look at, at ranching as, as not a business, but it is. Their bottom line is bringing in income so that they can continue to support their ranching lifestyles. And uh, understanding and working directly with them so that it is a win for them, but it's also a win for conservation and for wildlife is critical. Um, and we've been very fortunate to, to work with many different landowners and everybody's been on the same page. We've, we've never had to, any landowner that we've had to refuse or they refused us to, to work with them. Um, I guess, how much time do I have, Ariel? I think uh, I think we should try to pass it on to Jerry pretty soon. If uh, okay. we've got some last thoughts, or we can keep them for the Q and A and discussion. Um. Yeah, let, we can keep them on. Let Jerry talk, and and um, they've heard enough from me for a while. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. We appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'll pass it on to Jerry real quick. Jerry is uh, fresh out of the environmental consulting world where he conducted biological surveys throughout Arizona to ensure NEPA compliance for developing lands over the last five years. He's currently working with Arizona Game and Fish Department as a contractor with Quail Forever out of the Tucson Regional Office, where he works in the Landowner Relations Program to ensure habitat quality and connectivity for Arizona's wildlife. He has a master's degree in natural, natural resource management from the University of Arizona and has done international work and research experience from Central America to the Mogollon Plateau. So I'll pass it right along to you, Jerry. You can uh, share your screen and, uh, and uh, turn on your video. How's that look? Looks great. Just hit that presenter button and uh, we're good to go. The tongue there. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Hey, everyone. My name is Jerry Berthelet. Um, I'm working with Game and Fish. As Ariel told me, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm working in their Game and Fish Department's Land on a Relations Program. And like you said, I'm kind of in this dual position. I also work with uh, the international organization Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. So Quail Forever is like a habitat conservation group. Um, they do projects all over the country and depending on the region of the country you're in, kind of dictates what kind of projects you're executing. Um, but here in Southeastern Arizona, I'm doing a lot of habitat modifications, including 
these like fence removals like John was talking about, some of the speed grubbing. Um, yeah, habitat improvement stuff. And I'll get into that kind of as I go through this slideshow. So like I said, um, I'm in the Landmark Relations Program with the Game and Fish Department. If you're not familiar with how the Game and Fish Department is uh, set up throughout the state, there's six different regions and I'm located in Tucson in the Region 5 office. So um, yeah, I'm based out of Tucson. And basically we have all these LRP specialists. There's typically one LRP specialist per region, um, but here in Southeast Arizona, we have a fairly complicated landscape. We've got these sky islands, we've got these really historic grasslands that are crucial to some of the areas down here in the wildlife. So uh, between the sensitive landscape and the complicated array of land ownership in southeastern Arizona, we've split the position into two roles down here, whereas most other regions only have one LRP specialist. And so here in region five, in that green blob here in southeast Arizona, um, we have two of us. And my role is specifically to do habitat conservation, implement habitat projects on the ground, whereas my partner, Matt Walton, his role is to deal with access issues. And so he deals with a lot of like locked gates going through public and private lands and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll touch briefly on that, but it's not really my role. My, my big role is implementing habitat conservation on the ground. So a typical, this is pretty vague here, but the typical steps necessary to, for me to execute my role, um, really I should have like a, 0.5 in here before the one, because before the site visit happens, um, a lot of my time is spent traveling around the region and meeting up with different ranchers. Um, I, I, I go to these different conservation district meetings that have basically groups of ranchers or state agencies or federal agencies that come to these meetings and these local groups throughout the region, there are several of them. They discuss, uh, they discuss priority like needs, conservation needs within their area. And so these ranchers will talk about different water access issues that they have and just the drought that they're experiencing. And so um, I try to make it to as many of these different group meetings as possible and they can take up a bunch of my time, but really it's a crucial step for my role to be successful because without meeting these ranchers and these landowners, I'm not able to do any of these projects because I need to meet them and then they need to contact me so that we can sort of discuss the possibilities for the types of projects that we can execute on the lands. So that being said, after, after I kind of go and meet with these different rancher groups, typically it's ideal if somebody calls me with um, a need within their land, uh, their leased land or their private land or something like that. And they'll, they'll kind of explain it to me. And in order for me to get a better idea of what the situation is, I have to do a site visit. So I'll plan a site visit. I'll, I'll try and get some other partners out there. Um, our wildlife managers are always out in the region talking to these ranchers and these different landowners. And so I'll try and contact a wildlife manager who um, works in the area of the, the rancher that's calling me. And so I'll, I'll talk to the wildlife manager, get them on board with this project idea. And they can kind of help guide me with kind of uh, how to work with the ranchers up in that region because that's their region and they kind of work with them all the time. So after a site visit is done, uh, we'll spend the day, we'll drive around on quads or trucks or whatever and kind of look at the problems, whether it's uh, water access, um, some old fence lines or anything really. Um, we kind of look at the problems and then we kind of talk, talk through the problems and decide how they can benefit wildlife if we were to fix the problems and how they can benefit the rancher. Typically with these cattle operations, um, a lot of the projects that we do are gonna benefit the cattle as well as the wildlife. And so it's kind of the, you, you have to bet, there has to be some benefit to wildlife in order for these projects to be implemented. And so that's where I come in and I work with the rancher and they have a problem typically with their cattle, but we can kind of work with them to fix the problem that they're experiencing and have it also benefit some of this wildlife. So once I do the site visit, um, typically the rancher or somebody, the landowner will have uh, a map of their property. And so we can determine the land ownership around the property. And 
depending on the different types of land management, um, there's different compliance necessities. And so Arizona State Land or BLM, US Forest Service, they all have different requirements for the type of permits and the type of uh, habitat modifications that you can execute on these lands. And so we need to know what the background is, who the land management, land management agency is, and then I can kind of get back to the office and figure out what kind of permits are necessary, what surveys are necessary, if there's endangered species on the property, how do we work around that? Um, yeah, if there's like cultural resources on the property, how do we how do we navigate that issue? And so that's all the compliance stuff that I'll I'll take care of uh, back at my desk at the office. Um, meanwhile, the rancher, the landowner, is is pretty good usually at determining the cost of materials. And so they they're they've been ranching typically their whole lives, and so they'll have a good idea on kind of what's needed to fix the problem, and we'll work together to come up with a few different cost estimates. Um, and then we'll try and find the lowest lowest cost. Um, yeah, then determine landowner's labor contribution value. Like John had mentioned, there's often like a like a fifty percent match or a thirty percent match uh, that are required in some of these grant processes. And so, um, in a lot of the work that I do, the habitat modification, uh, the rancher is oftentimes able to do the work themselves. And so. Some of my biggest projects include uh, just grubbing mesquite trees out of the ground. And so really the hands-on labor of somebody being out there every day and pulling these mesquite trees out of the landscape, that's a lot of work and that's somebody's time and it costs money and you gotta pay for fuel costs and stuff like that. So if the rancher is able to um, do that work himself, then that can contribute as a match towards the project that I'm gonna work on uh, seeking from these other partnerships. Um, so then we determine the total project cost. Again, just like talking to the landowner and figuring out what we really need. And then I can kind of work through the rest of the process of um, figuring out the exact amount of money that I need to request, how much I can get from grants or different NGOs or um, Game and Fish. And then I work through like a cost benefit analysis and I work with the department to make sure everybody's on board, um, the rancher, the landowner's on board. The land management agency is on board, game and fish is on board, and uh, that, that's how we kind of move forward with that. Um, so yeah, here's a landscape. This is, um, this is over in the Altar Valley. Um, it just kind of shows what we do. I know that the picture is covered up by this flow chart here, but basically the flow chart is talking about how I, what I just mentioned in the previous slide. We sort of determine the land ownership and then from there we talk about uh, the landowner control whether or not the landowner controls access to the land if it's public land and then we go through this flow chart and sort of determine who the land ownership is what the necessary necessary permits and stuff are and then kind of where the funding can come from. that's like the end result of this flow chart this here is a project um, that was done by, by my predecessor in the altar valley where we pulled a bunch of mesquite trees and then I think John had showed a picture um, also of just like piling the debris up in these piles spread throughout the landscape. Some different landowners choose to burn the piles. Other ones like them spread across the landscape. They both have benefits. Um, you know, the pronghorn antelope like to have like a long sight, line of sight in the grasslands. And so that's a big reason for pulling these mesquite trees, but also these piles of debris can provide uh, some quail habitat or some other grass on obligate species habitat. And so oftentimes we'll leave the piles here and we try to keep them below like six feet and a certain diameter. But um, it's really it's really up to the landowner and like the proposal, that whole process in determining what's the best for the land and the wildlife. Um, again, can't really do this job without the landowners here in the landowner relations program. So it's kind of a neat position that I'm in because my role really with Game and Fish is to, to be the mediator between the landowners, these uh, land management agencies, um, the outdoor recreators who want to use this public land. Um, sometimes the outdoor recreators, there's always some bad actors here and there. And so if there's a hunter or somebody who's trying to go through some piece of private land on a forest service road, um, sometimes they'll leave some trash or they'll tear up the road. And so Ranchers often will just lock the gates, even though they're on US Forest Service roads. And so that 
how can I prevent people from being able to pass through the private land to get to the public land behind the private land? And so my role is to work with these landowners. And like I mentioned, my partner deals with access issues. So between myself and him and these landowners, we sort of come to an agreement on how we can allow people through their lands. Oftentimes there's a monetary incentive for these landowners. And so if, if, if you know anybody who's got some private land that's gated off on like a forest service road, um, there are benefits to having, to working with game and fish and allowing um, hunters or outdoor recreators through the property. Um, we can provide extra signage to make sure that people aren't destroying the land. They're not camping where they're not supposed to. They're staying on the road, they're not littering. Um, we just want to be able to provide outdoor access to these recreators. So yeah, again, the land relations program, big focus is reducing conflict with these landowners, the lessees and uh, the sportsmen, different outdoor recreators, um, and trying to maintain that relationship between uh, all parties involved. Um, my role specifically is to execute habitat improvement projects on the land. And so once we sort of come to an agreement on how to get people through the property, then I can work with them on coming up with um, I'm going to move a little quicker here because we're running out of time, but basically this work is not possible. Game of Fish doesn't have all the money in the world, and so I work with all these different partners. Um, if I've got a project that benefits, for example, Pronghorn, I'll contact John Milligan or Glenn Dickens and talk about how the Arizona Antelope Foundation can benefit from these projects, and, uh, and so they can offer funds to help support the project that I'm trying to execute. Um, but really it's a collaboration between all these different organizations. And so I'll be calling several different agencies, several different uh, printer groups as they're kind of uh, colloquial, colloquially known. Um, I'll contact them all, say, hey, you know, for example, this one area benefits mule deer. Is the Mule Deer Foundation willing to support this, this project? And, and we'll kind of shoot back and forth on how we can get it done. Okay, this is just talking about different funding opportunities, um, all sorts of different local, state, and federal different opportunities. Um, it's just a matter of me, me finding the right ones that's appropriate for the project at hand. So if you're not familiar with Region 5, it's this kind of big outlined area in southeastern Arizona. Got a few polygons on here. These are some of my project areas. It's kind of hard to see because it's so small, but this giant uh, mitten kind of triangles the Fort Huachuca set in the landscape. So I'm in communication with Amber Morin. We're trying to get some stuff done out there. Um, but one of my bigger projects right now is the South, uh, Southern Arizona Grassland Initiative, <clears throat> working with these four different landowners. And across the four landowners, there's almost 5,000 acres of land that's ready to be um, improved, to be given a treatment. So I'm working on about two and a half million dollars worth of grubbing and we'll be pulling the ski trees out of these four landowners' lands for the next few years. Um, and I'm always looking for different matches, different organizations to contribute to the project because that's how we kind of get it done. So just quickly, some more projects that we go through. Here's some burning. Uh, we don't do much burning down here, um, but this is in unit 27. So really the sky's the limit. If, it, if it's a habitat improvement method, then talk to Game and Fish, talk to the Land Relations Program, we can kind of work through it and talk about uh, what we can get done. Here's another just improvement project. Again, you know, we had burning. This is uh, this is stream bank stabilization. So we do water, water projects. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but what we really like to see are these big landscape level habitat restoration projects. And so you can kind of see in this, this image here, we've got this like checkerboard landscape of different land ownerships. And so when we have different projects that are spread out throughout like this checkerboard, uh, we like to try and connect them. So the pinkish areas are completed treatments from 20, 2004 to 2010. And we wanna see these connected projects because they allow for more mobility for the wildlife through the landscape. Just a picture of some pronghorn. Um, I've been on a fencing project before and we'll, we'll be pulling fence down and we'll see their gear or pronghorn immediately use this landscape right after pulling the fences down. So this one habitat modification is making some better use. 
Um, this is the Ohako Grassland Restoration Project. We don't need to go through the specifics, but you can see in these images, the top image shows all the mesquite trees pre-treatment, and then the bottom image shows post-treatment. So you can see just a drastic difference in the uh, line of sight visibility, the amount of mesquite trees in the landscape. And these mesquite trees are invasive. So um, there's a little bit of debate uh, if this is the optimal um, strategy, but that being said, it's a good strategy. So it's a strategy that we use and um, it can really make a big difference when you look at it. So that's what we're going for. A couple smaller projects we do is we'll do solar conversions like John had mentioned. Um, we just finished up a project down in the Patagonias where a woman was not able to get water to her tank. She was using this diesel generator and it just requires so much maintenance and uh, she was constantly having to deal with this generator and she could only physically turn it on and physically turn it off. And so we installed the solar panel so that it's just always pumping water and she instantly was uh, seeing results and all her tanks were filled. And so she she's just a happy camper. That's the kind of stuff we want to see. Also wild ranch ramps. Um, we, we can provide ramps for ranchers if they find stuff getting stuck in their, their tanks or their drinkers. Um, we don't want to be killing wildlife, so uh, we like to provide these ramps. Whenever. Okay, I think we still have 15 minutes or so for questions, but I'll stop the presentation here. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. And thank you, John. Really appreciate y'all taking the time and uh, and providing us some information, both about the landowner relationship, the relations program, and the work that, that you do through that, Jerry. And um, yeah, the amazing work that the Arizona Antelope Foundation has, has done. We got a ton of really great questions in the chat. Um, and I'll try to I'll try to do my best to to bring some of those both to um, to John and, and Jerry, but also we have 96 people on the call today and a lot of people have plenty of experience doing grassland restoration and supporting pronghorn. So I uh, really wanna encourage people as we ask these questions to you know, raise, use the raise hand function or unmute yourselves and, and jump in if you, have, uh, if you have something to add. Um, great, so why don't we start with, um, there were a few questions about uh, the success rate of some of these uh, herbicide projects and grubbing projects, and whether there's monitoring data to, to share from the success of these projects longer term. Um, people are asking for that. There's a few people who mentioned in the chat that it would be helpful to be able to provide some of that data to, to funders who are looking for um, when they're when they're applying for funding for projects to see that the effectiveness of different treatment types. So maybe uh, John, John first, and then Jerry, if y'all have any um, any lessons learned about the, the effectiveness of some of these treatments, especially long-term, and, uh, and whether we have any, any data to share. And if other people have stuff to, to pitch in, go ahead and, and chime in in the chat. Uh, thanks, Ariel. Um, most of the herbicides that we use, as I mentioned earlier, were aerial, foliar, or ground application. We relied heavily on our partnerships with the NRCS in, in the areas that we were working in. Um, they've done a lot of work with, with different herbicides. Um, they've done monitoring of those areas. They've done post surveys in a lot of those areas to determine which herbicide would work best um, depending on, on the area that we're doing, um, whatever the soil types were, the size of the mesquites that we're working at, um, the time of, uh, of year of application, just a whole gamut of different environmental conditions are, are issues with when we're putting herbicides. Not only that, but needing to get a qualified applicators to put that down as well. Um, the upside of herbicide application is that you, its cost is cheaper than grubbing um, and you're not going to need a cultural clearance needs that you do when you're when you're utilizing grubbing opportunities and primarily they're used for maintenance after an area has been grubbed and um, you're coming back in and you're getting that second growth um, fire in a lot of instances we found especially with mesquite the fires are never hot enough um, to really they'll set back the mesquite but it doesn't actually kill the mesquite and it's also been um, that not that effective and it's also an issue when we're dealing with ranches because their area 
there are past years where we're doing that burn is out of production for a couple of years, depending on what the land management agent or land man, the land um, that they're on and what the land management agencies uh, require of them before they can move back and, and do um, grazing in those areas. Uh, most of the stuff, I know one of the questions was what, what herbicide did we use for stump treatment? Um, we were using Valpar for that and that's a, a ground-based application where you spray it close, not on the tree, but just close to the, to the, the base of the tree. Um, as for monitoring, we just started doing this a couple years ago on utilizing herbicide for maintenance. I went in and did um, developed um, plots at each area that we had, were going to do monitoring. <clears throat> and I, I went in then and counted the, the number of mesquites and got mes mesquites per acre, which assisted me and the size which assisted me on determining what um, herbicide we're going to use and then the amount necessary for our grants. And um, after the issue is that most of these herbicides, once you apply them, they can their effectiveness depending on the time that they, they go into the ground because of rain, but they can it take three years possibly on a lot of these herbicides before you're seeing the full effectiveness. Um, most of the stuff that we have done here, there's a couple that we've done within three years, but most of them have been within two. I've gone and got preliminary um, post herbicide um, transex I've run and got some information, but I'm planning on going out this year and next year to see after that three year time frame to get more of a realistic idea of what the, the, the kill rate of those herbicides were. And we've used pretty much, like I said, Valpar. Um, and then a Sendero, a Remedy Reclaim mixture, and that's a foliar spray. Thanks, John. Um, Jerry, do you have any any data to share or any, um, anything to share about the, either the monitoring plan or the effectiveness, the, how, how long those, those projects are effective for, depending on the removal mm -hmm. technique? No, not really. I, I've only been in this role for the last one years, so I haven't personally been able to see that effectiveness or the efficiency of these treatments, but um, but they they can work. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Anybody else from uh, who's who's on the line today have anything to share about the what what folks have found is more effective in terms of removal techniques or, or follow up treatments and and the, the long term effectiveness of of these methods? I do know that since we rely heavily on um, NRCS, they have done. Some of that they've looked at different herbicide treatments in different areas and they do have data um, on some of those treatments in the past. Thanks John. Um, there was another question here from Alex Rogs. Rockstad, hope I'm not messing up that name too bad. Um, and about the the presence of invasive herbs or forbs, and I'd include grasses after some of these removal projects. Um, yeah, had, John, do you have any any thoughts or or experience to share about what sort of species come back after treatment and whether that's a concern of yours? Well, I don't really have a lot. I'm not a, a range biologist. Again, we rely on the NRCS or if it's Forest Service or BLM, for them to go out and do transects on that to look. I do know that most of these areas that we had had a lot of layman love grass. Um, there was um, native grasses in there as well. And we have seen, and I've been at, at meetings to show that if there is any disturbance, sometimes you get that layman love grass to come back into those areas. Um, but we really haven't in talking to the landowners we really haven't seen an issue with any of the um, non-natives or invasive species coming back in there and, and having any um, adverse effects on the, on their livestock grazing or on the wildlife that have moved back into that area and expanded into many of those areas thanks john um, yeah, and again, if anybody else who's on the line right now has, has any thoughts or anything else to add, please just go ahead and chime in. Don't be shy. 
Um, we had some questions, uh, a question from Stephanie Dorries about uh, the location for water improvements and water projects and how you chose the locations um, to, to, to do some of these water projects for pronghorn and whether you have any uh, any data or any ideas about how, how they're used. Are, are pronghorn using these watering projects? Is there conflict in between pronghorn and, and livestock? Meaning that if there's a, it's a, if it's a livestock tank that you're improving, maybe the pronghorn will be hesitant to use it. Um, if there are livestock present, things, things of that nature. Um, part of our GIS uh, work that we did in mapping, we went in and looked at all the areas where there was uh, year round waters. We tried to identify, there's a lot of areas there are waters, but they're not year round waters. Um, and so we, for pronghorn, what we were trying to do is within every mile, we'd like to have a, a year round water. Some instances you can't have that. So at least within every two miles, because that's needed um, when those does are fawning so that they can go and get water on a yearly basis or daily basis. And they're not going to want to move over that mile um, range. So we try to get a radius of one mile between each water. A lot of these waters were already on the ground, but again, they were potentially with um, the well wasn't working anymore. Um, they were having a lot of issues with a generator, as Jerry mentioned, or with windmills. So in that instance, we, you know, we worked with a landowner and put in solar wells into there. And so right now, as I mentioned, when we talked about all the um, waters that we did, um, the 13 water projects that we, we finished and throughout those areas, that's on top of the waters that were already out there and maintained. And all these waters, even after they're done, are maintained by the landowners. Uh, we may be able to go in there and assist if something goes down um, to assist them with a solar that go, panel goes down or well goes down, but they maintain them on a yearly basis. Part of our agreements with them is that those waters are going to be left on year round for wildlife. And then there's escape ramps in all those waters as well, so the wildlife can get in and get out um, without any issues. Um, what was the other part of that question? Um, oh, if, if livestock. We have not had any issues with livestock um, having interference with um, wildlife getting into those waters. In some instances, um, if we did see that, then we made an exclosure fence around there, um, much like that photo I showed on the BLM. Um, there are other waters in that area, but this water was uh, put in there specifically for pronghorn and other wildlife species, so that, that has a fence exclosure around that as well. So if we did have any issues, we worked uh, with the landowners um, to mitigate any of those issues that may arise. But overall, we have had no problems with um, with livestock grazing and livestock use or wildlife use. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, we're coming close to, to three o'clock, which is uh, the time that we had allotted for this. Uh, both John and Jerry have said that they're available to stay on a little bit longer and answer questions. But just in case folks have to leave right at three, I wanted to make sure that um, people are aware that we will be posting this webinar recording on our YouTube channel. We'll, I'll be sending out a little summary, including some of the resources that people put in the chat um, and some of the data that people have, have, have added here, um, just to make sure that everybody gets that and a summary of the discussion. And, um, I also wanted to make sure that people know that we have another uh, webinar about supporting pronghorn coming up. Uh, we're gonna be talking with, hearing from Stephanie and, and some other folks who worked on the Sonoran pronghorn recovery effort. Um, and that is, on, if, you, if you register for this webinar, I'll, I'll send you, make sure that you, set, you get the link to, to register for that one as well. I'm really excited about that. Um, and the date for that one is um, on August 30th. Um, we also have, uh, because people seem to be interested in, in mesquite control, we're going to be hearing on August 2nd from some folks in West Texas about, um, you know, four or five years down the line, what, what were the results of aerial herbicide treatments to control honey mesquite around Elephant Mountain wildlife area. So definitely stay tuned for those and, and log on. Um, but at this point, I'm going to just open it up to, to everybody who's here. If anybody has any questions for, for John and Jerry or just for the group, um, Please go ahead and unmute yourselves if I didn't get to your question or if you have anything else that you'd like to like to ask or discuss.
Yeah, hi, John. Ty's here. Hi, Ty's. Um, yeah, I made a couple comments in there about birds, of course. And um, I know Game and Fish had invested. Hi, Ty's. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, great to, great see, to see you. See nice you. work. Nice presentation. And, um, you know, it's there's so many nuances to these various um, treatments. And um, I seem to recollect that Winrow treatment seem to have a stronger native bird response in terms of bird, birds using those treated sites, how that might compare with the brush pile approach. Uh, but just generally, um, especially with Gerald talking at such a high level statewide, having a better understanding of how other wildlife species respond to these treatments so that um, we, we have a better sense of um, the, the full ecological response. It's way past your scope, John. You know, you're focused on the pronghorn and that's clearly been working for that animal. Um, and it would be interesting to get a CCAS presentation on some of the data that's being collected that I know others have been doing. So maybe Ariel, something to think about in the future. Yeah, thanks, Tice. I think that uh, there's an increasing awareness of the importance of considering multiple species, especially when we're talking about restoring an ecosystem type like grasslands. Um, yeah, I know there's a few folks on, on this call who might have some, some, some stuff to say. Gary, did you have something to pitch in there as well? Can I just say, say something real quick? Hey, Tice, nice to meet you. Um, I, so like, I'm fairly new to this role, but I, um, I do know that we do, we do have like environmental compliance that we need to go through when we're figuring out land ownership and stuff like that. And so we run these reports that determine the species on the landscape within the project area that we're trying to, um, work in. And so if there's sensitive species in there, then we have to go through all sorts of different steps, working with the state, um, and fish and wildlife on how to proceed. And so there's certain mitigative measures that the landowners and we need to take in order to execute these projects. And so we're not just considering antelope or quail or something. We are trying to consider all these different species on the landscape. Hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better. Ariel, if I may add just a little bit to yeah. that too. Um, Tice, um, as you know, we, we've discussed this with, with grassland birds and the need for surveys many um, different meetings over the years. Um, and, and I'm very sensitive to that to, as well. Once we've moved out of that Bonita area and what we're seeing now is that that area was primarily just pronghorn habitat right there. But now what we're moving in is we're moving up into the uplands and into other areas that like in Allen Flat and, and in some of the areas on the higher upper elevations, mid range outside of Bonita when you're getting up into the, the, the foothills and that type of stuff. We're dealing with a lot of different species, um, different grassland species. We're with mule deer, javelina, big game species, and everything else. And we've we've sat down with some ranches that are doing some pr grubbing projects into there, and with the game and fish, um, and with NRCS and the landowner and the applicator that was going to be doing the grubbing. And we sat down and and worked on developing completely different prescriptions for those areas. So that we're not, we're looking at benefiting pronghorn and pronghorn movement, but we're also benefiting corridors and habitat for um, quail, not only grassland birds uh, and other big game species as well. So that they have those components necessary rather than just going in and, and cleaning out all the mesquite into an area in the drainages and everything else, we started working with them and, and that's in its infancy right now. We're looking at some of those projects and we're going back in to look at that and hopefully Jerry will be able to be an, uh, a, a huge help in going back and starting to look at some of those projects and seeing if we need to tweak those prescriptions. Um, we know that there's probably gonna be things that we could do better after our initial um, projects. Um, but we'd like to go in and the ranches that we've dealt with are really willing to work with us and develop pres prescriptions that are gonna benefit them, but benefit wildlife as well. Yeah, thanks, John. That's great to hear. And there, there, there are definitely folks who are working on decision support tools and gathering data about the effects of woody plant 
removal, whether it's mesquite or juniper in different ecosystems, what the lift is for specific bird species. And um, yeah, we're really interested in, in bringing that data in and finding, also finding some models that can help us um, estimate the effectiveness uh, based on those bird surveys or increase some of those bird surveys in, in these project areas, providing that, that synergy. Um, great, I see that Scott posted a, a, um, a paper in the chat here for folks about woody plant encroachment, restructuring bird communities in Sydney Heritage grasslands. Thanks, Scott, that's great, appreciate it. And thank you, Tice, for the great question. Um, does anybody else wanna have a question that they wanna ask, ask to the group or, or something they wanna discuss while we're here today? I know there were some folks who had mentioned um, the Nature Conservancy's Damien was here. I'm not sure if Damien, you're still on, but talking about the 2013 assessment of uh, Arizona's grasslands and grassland conditions, trying to identify priority areas to restore. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else who's on the line today has been working on identifying priority areas or has has tools to share or resources to share about where to where to focus that grassland restoration work. Hey Ariel, yeah, I mean, I I shared that link. Um, you know, I think that's a that assessment. Has, a, has some really good analysis in it. But as Tice pointed out, you know, it would be great to update that, not only just to see kind of how our grasslands have changed over the past 20 years, uh, in some cases getting more fire on the landscape, but then also, you know, a two decade drought. But I think the other hand is that that document talked quite a bit about what had restoration potential. Um, and as she pointed out, there's places that, that work has been done to do restoration. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's a bit overdue for update. I'm not sure who can take that on, <laughs> but uh, it would be really interesting to see kind of how that reality over two decades has changed, where have successes happened, where they haven't, and, and all those dynamics. So anyway, food for thought. Thanks, Damien. And, and thank you to the presenters as well. I enjoyed it. Agreed. Well, I, I do know that that monitoring pre and post is always sort of the the bugaboo on getting that accomplished and finding the funding and, and personnel to get out there and do that. It's really an important aspect of what we're doing. Um, if we're going to have know what the end result is and if we need to tweak our process and see if it's benefiting or are we having issues with what we're doing. And um, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a lot smarter minds out there than me, but that, getting that that the personnel on the ground to do that and then the the uh, the funding to have that accomplished is very difficult. Are there any other questions that we have from the from the group today for our presenters or for, for the other experts in the room? Hi, this is Stephanie Dorries. I just wanted to ask about the uh, the styles that you're using for your water developments. It looks like most of them are you know based on some sort of well or pump that has a storage tank feeding uh, troughs via float valve. Do you have any in more remote areas where you don't necessarily have access to a well or are they all follow that same basic design? For the most part, they follow that same basic design. I mean, in some instances, our water lines are miles long where they will utilize a, a well and then put storage, a couple 10,000 gallon storage tanks and then sort of you will have to push them out of there to different areas of their ranch, um, to different pastures and that type of thing. The other aspect that we have done is if there's areas in there, drilling wells in an area is not easy anymore. You just can't go and drop a hole in the ground and, and get water wherever you want. Um, so we've utilized some of those um, dirt tanks and clean outs of those dirt tanks and use those in some of those areas that were void of um, wells or water to get in there. The one thing that we have found though is with our, our brush treatments is that 
there's not nearly as much runoff, therefore not as much sedimentation or erosion, because when we remove those mesquites from the ground, the land, then the, the grasses and forbs and herbs and everything else came into that area. But the water that goes in there, and I've talked with numerous ranches about this, the water that goes into those is much cleaner. It doesn't have that silt component to it. Um, so that has been a, a huge benefit and we're not utilizing that erosion or, or sedimentation that we've had in the past and, and real erosion that happened in the past. So there are benefits with that. But unfortunately in arid area like this, we're primarily relying on wells. Thank you. To, to add on to that, um, to what extent are these waters being monitored? For, for example, with is, do you have people potentially using cameras? Or are you just relying on your partnerships with ranchers? How are you making sure that, how are you evaluating the, the success of these waters as far as pronghorn management goes? It's a good question. Um, Damon Fish, the wildlife manager out in the field within those districts on a year round basis, they're out there looking at them. Um, we also have uh, other state agencies and federal agencies going out there and working with the landowners on, on their grazing allotments on a year round basis. So those two partnerships that we've de developed over time. And then I try to get back out there um, on a yearly basis if I can, or every couple of years to go back in there, especially during the driest part of the year to make sure that those are up. What I've seen over the years is once we've entered into agreement with these landowners, um, they understand that it's a partnership and it's a two-way partnership and we've never had anybody go up there. There's occasions when we may get calls and says, hey, my well went down or water line broke. I need, I need, there's going to be down a little bit. Um, but for the most part, we haven't had any issues. And I will say this, the game and fish throughout Arizona has been hauling water. I don't know how many thousands of gallons they've been hauling throughout Arizona for for wildlife and throughout southeastern Arizona not one drop of water was hauled to any of our pronghorn subpopulations or herd zones here in southeastern Arizona. So it sort of is a testament to the water development that we have put out on the ground um, and the support that we've had from ranchers. Just, just to build off that real quick too Stephanie, um, like John mentioned a big role of the wildlife managers is to go out there and check waters. And so for, on, from Game and Fish's perspective, we have wildlife managers who are out there all the time, hauling water and checking waters. Um, but on a different note, I, a proposal just came across my desk the other day um, where somebody wants to install this like remote monitoring system on the, on the water. And I don't know how often this has been utilized in the past, but they wanna be able to put this little system on the water tank and so that they can measure the water from their house. They don't have to go out there. It's a super remote area. So I don't know how that'll play out, but I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah, I think um, if you have like a lot, of, I've heard of people using data, data loggers, like, like weather station data loggers to test, to check on water levels. I think uh, organ pipe, relies on data loggers to check water levels within their wells. Right? So, I mean, some of these systems are so sophisticated where you can have those data loggers connected to your cell phone and you can keep tabs on things through your cell phone. So I mean, some of those systems are, are really, really impressive. Thanks, y'all. Um, any other questions for the presenters? We're a little bit over the, the three o'clock, 10 minutes over, but, uh, but we still have a little bit of time if anybody's got any, any burning, burning questions they still wanna, wanna bring to the group. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll, um, we'll make sure to send out some typed up answers for this for future reference. Um, some of the resources that people put in the chat. Um, we'll make sure everybody knows about the upcoming webinars that CCAST has. And uh, yeah, thank you again for joining us today. We appreciate it, everyone.